Hello there and welcome to the Sound of the Loons podcast presented by Alina Health Orthopaedics. Now, before we get started, uh, we do have to pay respects to one of American soccer's fallen giants. Um, Grant Wall was a pioneer. Uh, Grant Wall, to many, was a colleague. To many, he was a friend. And to several, he was family. Minnesota United in a club statement said, our club is heartbroken at the news of Grant Wall's passing. His passion for covering and growing the sport of soccer was unmatched. He will be missed deeply by everyone in our soccer community and the sport will not be the same without him. Our thoughts are with his family at this difficult time. Uh, never a truer word spoken, really. Um, Grant Wall, as I said, in, in my opinion, Kendra was a pioneer. Uh, as far as I'm aware, he was the first full-time soccer writer in the United States and has been tremendously influential to just about everybody in some way, shape or form, those of us that are involved in soccer in North America. Um, I know every interaction I had with him was warm and pleasant. Uh, I first met him in Kansas City at a watch party of some sort and one of the things I loved most about Grant was that he was just as passionate a fan as he was a journalist and um, was always very, very welcoming. I saw him a couple of weeks ago, just before the World Cup started at a, a US men's national team press conference uh, in Brooklyn. And he was as engaging and as warm as ever in that particular situation as well. And um, it, it it's hard to... It's hard to think this is real life. It, it's it, it's unbelievable. What what memories do you have of Grant Wall? Well, I remember specifically meeting him in 2015 at the Women's World Cup in Vancouver, and he was, you know, obviously a special reporter for Fox at the time, and doing all the feature stories and the in depth reporting and the the connections that he had. And part of the reason he had so many connections was because he was an incredible human being. He had every relationship you could imagine because everybody wanted to talk to Grant Wall because he was so kind, so generous with his time. I met him in the green room on the Fox set and I was there before, I don't know what it was. We were going to do something, Jen and I, before getting our hair and makeup or something done to go to a game. And he was back in his green room where they all kind of gather to talk about what they're going to talk about that day. Never met him before. And he came up to me to introduce himself to say that he was a huge fan of Jen and I and what we had been able to do so far at that World Cup, it being our first time experiencing anything like that. And I just remembered how genuine he was when he talked to you and he asked you questions. He wanted to know about you. He wanted to know what you wanted to do. What do you want to be? What are your thoughts on, you know, this game, that game, this player, that player? He wasn't this, he, he had no sense of arrogance or, you know, he, he always cared about others before he cared about himself. And it was genuine every time you talk to him. And it, it's crazy because not that you want something like this to happen to then see what kind of effect he had on people. But when you saw on social media and you've seen on Twitter and not just the stories and the tributes that have been written and been done for him and about him, but people just commenting, whether it's in the soccer world or just in life in their interaction with him. And everybody says the same thing just an incredibly passionate, hardworking human being who wanted to grow the sport in this country and abroad. And I think that, um, you know, when I saw that on the bottom line that night, I absolutely, I was shocked. It's one of those punch in the gut moments that you don't even think is real. Yeah. And my husband and I were sitting there watching and we're like, this, this can't be true. This can't be real. And then right away you go trying to research it and trying to figure it out. And and find out about it. And you knew that everybody in Qatar hadn't woken up yet. They had been asleep. So then you're, you know, trying to see what other people, his former Fox colleagues and other writers and reporters, what their thoughts are, what what they know. Um, but none of them had even been aware of it yet because they had all been sleeping. And um, an absolute loss as a human being. And of course, for the soccer world. And you know what? I actually had another punch in the gut moment a couple of days later when I realized, he's not going to be here for the 2026 World Cup. Yeah, A guy who's grown the sport, who loves the sport, who's passionate, who wants it to be the best it can be here in the United States and America. And just thinking about referencing 2026 when the Men's World Cup is in North America and that he won't be able to witness that. 
it's another one of those punch in the gut moments. And and hopefully, you know, US soccer and or FIFA or whoever does something maybe in that World Cup and during that World Cup to honor uh, Grant Wall and what he meant to this sport. And just again, as a human being, even before a journalist. Yeah. And it's also um, even more heartbreaking when you think Kansas City is a host city. It's where Grant Wall is from, for those unaware. Um, an inexplicable loss. Um and it will never make sense. Um, so we just wanted to do a little tribute to Grant Wall here because uh, there will never be somebody like Grant Wall again. Um, he was a, a true inspiration and will be missed by absolutely everybody. Hello there and welcome to the Sound of the Loons podcast presented by Alina Health Orthopaedics. Callum Williams alongside Kendra D. St. Aubin, joined by a very special guest today. Technical Director of Minnesota United, Mark Watson, is here to talk all things Minnesota United, Major League Soccer, and we might even talk about that thing that's going on in Qatar as well. So um, let's let's start, shall we, Watto, with incoming deals for Minnesota United. Um, the three that immediately stick out in my mind, because we, we spoke about Cameron Dunbar in the previous podcast, uh, Daniil Henry, a Canadian centre-half who has had tremendous experience with Toronto, Vancouver. He was over at West Ham United in the English Premier League. He played for Blackburn Rovers in the, in the second tier in the Championship in England. Also played in the K-League as well. He, he is an international centre-half. Um, Zarek Valentin, who's been brought in at the age of 31, um, again, has played on the international shores in Norway. He's done ever so well with Portland Timbers and, and Montreal over the years. Clint Irwin has won MLS Cup with Toronto FC. He's been uh, a regular goalkeeper for the likes of Colorado Rapids over the course of the last couple of years. I know you can't say this, but but I can. Um, and I don't know the details, but... To my knowledge, these three signings are viewed as depth pieces. These are signings that are not going to break the bank. These are the types of signings that you simply need in Major League Soccer. Yeah, I mean, you 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 nailed it, Cal. I mean, we, we're really excited about the the signings, you know, and we we prefer to focus on, you know, the type of player and the type of character that we're we're bringing to the club. Um, you know, I think there's a common denominator with all three. We we've just added. Um, three top quality players with experience and they've just they've just boosted our kind of veteran leadership group you know they all have experience in the league they're all fantastic guys fantastic pros um, and we're, we're really excited about all of them they, they all serve a, a real defined purpose um, you know we signed Cameron Dunbar early he's a young one homegrown we, we're really excited about his future you know and then it's, it's all kind of working in phases so we we, we work with the the mechanisms that MLS has uh, postseason. So there's re-entry drafts, there's free agency, there's trades, there's, there's a, a bunch of different ways you can acquire players. So we felt, you know, given each individual individual situation, this was, this was a really uh, good move for us. And as you mentioned it, you know, we're always conscious of the budget. Um, and if players have a certain, you know, uh, value for money that we we think is is a really good addition that's that's attractive to us so but we're excited about all three when you look at specifically those three and talking about henry and valentine first clearly their backline reinforcement not knowing what debossi's situation is going to be coming off the injury Bo boxel getting a little bit up there in age and whatnot kamar was incredible on the left hand side but putting a lot of miles on those legs and dj taylor was sort of this unknown that just really kind of held his own on that right hand side so when you're looking at these guys whether they're free agents or claimed off waivers was was the back line a place that you were always looking for in the off season as far as getting some quality depth and, and kind of reinforcements not knowing what everyone was going to come back like next season yeah no ken it's certainly a focus for us and i think with with zarek um you know still uh a high level player and someone we know well, great leader and can play multiple positions. He can play both fullback positions and he can even play, play center back in a pinch. So we felt really good about that. Him as a person, him as a player and his versatility um, with Daniil, you know, and, and listen, we, we were very hopeful and we're very positive in terms of uh, Bakai Debassi returning to his, his level. And it's a very high level and he's, he's very impactful for us. You know, I think last year was a, was the best example of that. You know, and we um, we wobbled a little bit once he got injured and it took us a while to kind of 
um, get our, our group together again. So we're very hopeful that he'll come back to his level, you know, but we, we still need to build some, some depth around him. And, you know, we got Daniil off waivers. He's someone that we, we know well. He's at 200 games in MLS and international, played all around the world, uh, 29 years old and really athletic, you know, and, and like I said, common denominator, a fantastic guy and a, and a leader. So, um, you know, but given the, you know, the, the big overview of the back line, we're still, still looking to add a couple more players. Um, you know, we're probably going to look to use one of our U22 spots there, you know, with um, bringing in, you know, competitive players, making, making the spots uh, more, more difficult to get in the starting 11 and looking at the future. We're a little bit older along the back, so it's certainly something we're looking to address. Um, you know, we always have our first transfer window, which is, you know, February, March, April. And then we have a secondary window in the summer. So uh, ideally, we bring one or two players in the first window. Um, but given, you know, the, the leagues around the world and when players become available relative to their club teams, we may have to make one of those signings in the summer. But, you know, we're active on, on a bunch of different fronts and you know, there will still be more reinforcements along the back line. Well, so talk to me a little bit more about Daniil Henry. Um, I, I must admit, I, I thought this signing may very well happen at some stage, particularly when when he became into the situation that he found himself uh, and, and became available. There's a connection there with, with Stuart Kerr, the goalkeeping coach with Vancouver Whitecaps. I know he's somebody that rates Daniil Henry as well. Um, Daniil Henry, is he somebody that perhaps comes into this season with a little bit of a point to prove? He's 29 years of age now. Um, as you mentioned, has has played across the world. Hasn't been a regular fixture in the Canadian World Cup roster, um, in any Canadian roster over the course of the last couple of years. But in my opinion, can still consider himself a Canadian international, but he'll surely want to get back into that fold, would he not? No, agreed. And we do have a history with Daniel. We, we tried, uh, I guess, before he we went to the K League. So that's three years ago. So we, we made an attempt to sign him then. Uh, we felt he was a good profile, good size, athletic, um, and, uh, you know, just coming into the prime of his career. So I think he'd be the first to tell you he's been a little disappointed with the way that the past couple of years have been. So I do think he has a point to prove. He's a, you know, like I said, he's a great guy. He's a, he's a competitor, you know, and uh, he'll, he'll be wanting to establish himself as a, as a first choice center back. And, you know, there's there a lot of positives to, to bringing him in. Um, like we've touched on, but we know he's a competitor and he'll be he'll be fighting every day to to be a starter in our group. Talk to us a little bit about Clint Irwin and what you think he'll bring to the fold to the mix, acquiring him as a as a free agent and with Tyler Miller heading over to DC United. Yeah, so so Clint, um, seasoned veteran, tons tons of games played, and and a really great guy. And I think I think you know what Clint gives us is some leadership as well. He can play at a high level, um, you know, and I think he completes our group in terms of the correct balance. You know, we're, we were coming off a couple of years with, with Dane and Tyler and, you know, two elite goalkeepers, um, you know, we can go more into the Tyler situation, but there was, there was always, you know, some friction, not friction, but two, two players that should be starting. And it was, it was not easy to manage for the, for the staff, especially Stuart who worked, had to work them every day. Uh, but great guys, they handled it very professionally, but we knew that wasn't a permanent solution. So it was about finding um, who we thought was going to be our number one and then having to having to, to move the number two on. So, you know, once once Dane uh, established himself as the number one, then we were looking at, um, you know, making that group just more complete. And I think we have Dane, we have Clint and then we have a bunch of, you know, really talented young kids. Um, that are, are getting some minutes in MNUFC2 that we think have a bright future. So I think Clint's the perfect addition for us. Um, this also really helped, and this is part of, part of a deal. Um, when we looked at needing a number two, Clint was on the top of our list. He was number one. You know? And so we reached out to him in, in free agency and his agent, and we were the top of his list. So it came together quite quickly. Um, you know, when, and when a player really wants to play for your club, uh, that really matters. We want we want players that want to be here and and, and fight for the group. Um, so those two things aligned, and the deal came together quite quickly. Let's dive a little deeper into the the Tyler Miller situation, Shami Watto, and and th there's a lot of uh, irritated people with the fact that Minnesota United haven't gotten anything for Tyler Miller. But 
talk, talk us through that process because it, it's not as if you guys didn't try and get something for him. Um, you were never just going to give him away because he's a valuable asset. So, so talk us through what actually happened. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it was a long process. I mean, we had 18 to 24 months of, of Dane and, and Tyler kind of going head to head and, you know, switching off as our number one. So we were, we were looking at market value for both players for, you know, the better part of two years. Um, you know, and there was, there was never a deal we felt was of value. And, you know, in the end, we, once Dane established himself, himself as the number one, we were looking at, at opportunities to move Tyler. And I spoke to Tyler many times. He's in my office and he, we were upfront about it. If we can find a good offer for you, um, we'll look to move you. And he was, he was great about it. He understood the business and he was a, a true professional. So the, the whole process was, was very transparent. You know, in the end, we went down to the final hour before we had to, you know, pick up or decline an option. And there, there was, there was not a lot that was was attractive. You know, and the the problem was not that we didn't want to re-sign Tyler Miller. It was we had to re-sign Tyler Miller on his his cap number, which was it was over five hundred thousand. So that's that's a big number, as someone that we felt was was at that time a backup keeper. So. It wasn't, there wasn't interest in Tyler Miller. There, there wasn't interest on that number. So I know he's gone to DC at a significantly lower number. That's just part of the business, you know, but from, from our perspective and trying to get value for him, we tried right till the last minute and, you know, nothing, nothing came together. So, um, you know, in the end, it just wasn't sustainable. And, and we knew this day was going to happen, uh, but we feel really, really good about Clint coming on board and, and completing that goalkeeper unit. Um. What about players that are potentially and hopefully coming into the club? I know you're very busy uh, scouting all over the world at the moment, although I'm sure it's a little bit different with the World Cup going on. Um, you did a piece with one of the newspapers in the Twin Cities the other day, and the name Jonathan Gonzalez once again came up. What can you tell us about that particular player, Watto? Yeah, no, real simple. We're, we're trying to bring Jonathan back. Um, you know, he's, he's got a, he's got a great story um, and had a lot of really, really good years at Monterey. You know, now he's not, <coughs> excuse me, not in the first team there. So there was an opportunity for us. We brought him in. He's a fantastic kid. And we felt this was a good place for him to, um, you know, kind of go on the, the second phase of his, his professional career. So uh, we had him on loan. We've reached out to his club Monterey to, to try and extend that and bring him here full time. So you know, Jonathan's still on a significant contract. Um, they still have a high valuation on him. And in the end, we made an offer and we we hope we can get a deal done and have him back for 2023. Great player, still still very young and, and a fantastic kid. He fit the group really well. So we're very hopeful that we'll have Jonathan back for, for next season. A little bit more on on him and what he brings to the team in particular, because I don't think we've talked to you since you you also – um, made sure to keep and hang on to Josef Rosales as well. So when you talk about that center midfield role, that position, and people are going, well, you just signed Rosales. Do we need Gonzalez? You've got Robin who can play in there. Will Trapp's coming back. How do you see Gonzalez fitting, and how does he contribute with those other pieces that are also there as well? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be tough. When, when you look at that group, and you just mentioned it, Kendra, and if you throw Robin Lode into that group who you know made the shift from, from uh, wide right into central midfield and did really, really well, We've got an incredible group. So, you know, obviously trying to manage the budget and, and the numbers, um, but we think it's an opportunity for Jonathan to join that group. And then, you know, great competition for places. Like you said, we have Will Trapp, we have Robin Lud, we have Kervin Ariaga. Hassani Dotson coming back. We, I that forgot about him too. So you got all sorts of quality in there. Exactly. So, you know, it's, th there's a lot there. Um, given that depth, it may push Robin back wide. Um, you know, we can, we can look forward to some more goal production from him, which, you know, was negated a little bit, him playing midfield, but he did an excellent job there. The team played really well with him there. So, um, we're a little bit spoiled for choice in there, but we think on, on the right number, Jonathan would be a, a great addition to that group and, you know, gives some tactical flexibility if we ever wanted to play three in midfield and incredible competition for places. So, and that's, that's what we want at every position. December 21st, Watto, is a day that I'm sure has been circled on your calendar for some time. For those unaware, it is the day of this year's MLS Super Draft. Um, Minnesota have drafted tremendously well over the course of the last couple of years. 
what's the expectation this time and what are you hoping to get out of it? I mean, yeah, once again, we hope to get a, a potential first team player out of it. You know, we're a little bit down in the in the draft order, which is is you know great because it means we've had a fairly successful season, but it's also not great because you don't, you know, you, you prefer to be picking in the in the the top five. Um, but we've, you know, we've done our work. It's a little different dynamics, um, you know, because there's so many homegrown players. There's, you know, the the draft has shifted to more of a of a foreign player situation. So that's something we'll have to navigate. It's, you know, bringing a foreign player on, um, given the the roster build, you know. But we've we've scouted a lot of, you know, individual games. Then there was the combine last weekend in um, in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we got to take a look at a lot of these players together. Um, you know, and we've, we've been working these past couple of weeks, putting all the lists together. Um, there's always the debate of do we, do we sign the best player available or is it a more position specific thing? So we're working through that. Um, but we, we love the draft. It's an exciting time. You know, you always have your, your plans and your lists and your contingencies, but you, you never really know what happens until you until you get to your pick. There's always a, a couple of things that go on that uh, you don't expect, which can change the dynamic. So. But we're looking for another another talented potential first team player. I think the debate will con- kind of continue to rage on about the depth uh, that can be had and can be found in the draft um, here in the United States with the college system that we have. But also now, how much has it changed with the emphasis on academies, with MLS Next Pro, with all these other things? I know that Minnesota United is having a combine coming up here in January, trying to kind of bolster that talent on the roster in the academies in the youth system and M and UFC too. So how much now does that sort of play into maybe the importance or not importance of, of the draft going forward? Well, no, it's, it's a good question. It's changed the dynamics because we do have a second team. Um, you know, so you, you can think, you know, a little bit longer term play in terms of, you know, I don't think that player is ready right now to be on an MLS roster, but we have, we have the second team and that's one of the huge benefits of having the second team for these players that, you know, need to mature a little bit tactically or physically or whatever it is, we now have a, a perfect environment for them to be tucked away from the, the pressure of trying to get into the first team um, and playing regularly every Saturday. I mean, when you look at historically, and, and we've, I think we've done a good job of developing players relative to our, our structure, but we would have a lot of players that were very good college players, used to training through the week and playing a game on the weekend. And now we just don't have that opportunity. So I think, um, you know, other teams have had USL teams for a few years. I think every club will now have this second team. And, you know, I think eventually everyone will be an MLS next pro and it's a perfect environment for these kids. So we can look at a player that maybe isn't there yet, but we think in a year or two of um, being a professional and training and nutrition and um, high level competition can develop into that first team player. And there isn't the urgency that there would previously be being having to be on an MLS roster. Just piggybacking off of that, Watto, um, does Cam Knowles have much of a say in perhaps who's drafted then? Because these are the players, if they do make their way to MNUFC too, that he'll be working with and developing. No, he, he has a big say. He has a big say. Yeah. Um, so given the fact that we do have this second team and we have a new staff, um, that works with that second team. They do end earlier, so they they do a lion's share of our our college scouting. So um, we're now coming together, putting our list together. He was he was definitely at the combine with some first team staff this past weekend, um, and he's he's a big part of that decision. You know, ultimately we're still looking for a first team player, but like we discussed, there's some different variables and dynamics that go into that decision making process now. Okay, let's um, let's move on then to uh, the rest of Major League Soccer, shall we? Because uh, as you mentioned briefly earlier on, Walter, the, the transfer window uh, is open. Teams are starting to make deals. Um, I, I'd like to start first and foremost on, on a, a, a deal that didn't happen because I think it is a significant one and, and it is, again, a step forward for Major League Soccer. And I'll be interested to get your opinion, both of you, but, but Watto first. Um FC Cincinnati rejected a $7 million approach from Chivas Guadalajara uh, for Brandon Vasquez, who scored 18 goals in Major League Soccer last year and got a bucket load of assists as well, had a career year. Um, it wasn't too long ago, Watto, that a Major League Soccer team would have snapped anybody's hand off that offered $7 million for their players. Once again, it just shows how quickly and how wonderfully the league is growing, does it not? 
Cali it really does. There's been a massive paradigm shift in the past couple of years. Um, and, and it's a it's a difficult decision. Like, let's just use that the example you mentioned. Bras uh, Brandon Vasquez uh, came from Atlanta, where he hadn't really got into the team yet. He's just he's just caught fire. Big, strong guy, Mexican background. That's very attractive to Mexican teams, obviously. Um, now we've got this seven million dollar offer, which is very attractive. Like you said, in the past they're gonna they're gonna snatch your hand off. But what Cincinnati's confronted with now, they've they've struggled to be competitive. And this year they they made the playoffs for the first time. You know, they've 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 got some momentum going. So for them, it's a balance of, you know, this is a great offer. We will make a lot of money on this, but he's a big part of our team. And is that more important to keep this this competitive group together? So every every team has this uh, this decision to to make on is this a good a good value for us? We get all this money, but then what what do we do with this money? You know, it's oh, we'll go get another one. That's that's sometimes a little bit more difficult than it seems. Um, but you know, I, I think this is this is great for the league. The league wants to be, you know, at the forefront of developing top young players and selling them on to the, the top leagues around the world. And I think this is just another example. Um, the bar keeps getting set higher and higher every year. And like you said, the fact that Cincinnati are turning down seven million for a player they I think they got for three hundred thousand in GAM a couple of years ago, that's a tremendous profit. But they're looking at the bigger picture. But it, what it does show is, is this is now a league of choice for, for young, talented players to not only come in and, and help their team win games and be successful, but also make a, a big step to some, some bigger leagues out there. Doesn't it also feel like, too, without being inside FC Cincinnati and what their thought process is or any club, but the way that different clubs can be built for success? I mean, it was the epitome of it with the MLS Cup final when we saw how Philadelphia was built versus LAFC. With FC Cincinnati, to your point, they have been on the struggle bus since they entered the league, and it was important to them to move forward with some of those same pieces and keep him rather than sell Vasquez. How every there is no bulletproof way or, or foolproof way to build a club and find success, and it kind of continues that theme here in this league. It re it really does. Everyone has their unique situation, you know, and there, there's maybe not a bigger contrast, like you said, than LAFC and, and Philadelphia meeting in the final. Philadelphia, not a huge spend in terms of the, you know, the first team players, but a, a big spend on the academy. And they were in for the long haul, you know, not productive at the beginning, now very productive. So it's helping them win games. You look at Brendan Aronson, Mark McKenzie, um, and then they're they're moving their players on and uh, to good leagues in Europe and, and making money. And I think the one thing that, you know, LAFC are the opposite of that. They spend a lot of money. They're the big stars and they're, and they're kind of going for it on all fronts. And like I said, the the league wants to be known as uh, a league of choice for young players that can develop. We can make money, but the gap between where we are and those top leagues is, is getting, is getting closer. So as much as we, we want to develop players, we think we're an elite league now and getting better and better every year in terms of getting close to those big European markets. So it, it is one of the more interesting parts of, uh, of MLS, just in terms of how each club, you know, defines himself is it a strong academy and they focus on that is it a big discretionary spend is it something in the middle do you try and be competitive in all your different buckets whether it's academy uh college draft international scouting you know every, every team has a different way of going to go about doing their business and it you know there's been enough examples over the years where a bunch of different ways of going about it can can be successful another center forward that i'd like to just talk about quickly as well um Joseph Martinez, uh, it's obvious that he is available. Um, for me, I personally think he's going to end up in, in Liga MX. Um, but this is a, a really interesting story to follow, Watto, because we are all aware of what Joseph Martinez can offer. We are all aware of what he has done in Major League Soccer. Um, where do you see this particular storyline going? Do you see him staying in Major League Soccer or, or is there somewhere else perhaps that's more suited for him? Yeah, it's a good question, Cal. You know, I don't really know. I, I think there's there's possibilities with both. Staying in MLS, he's obviously, you know, a proven a proven goal scorer. You know, I think his his troubles are well documented the past couple of years. For me, it's a combination of, you know, he did have an ACL, which it doesn't look like he's completely recovered from, you know, and the, the purple patch that Atlanta had in their first couple of years, uh, and then kind of the not the downfall, but the, the struggles kind of 
coincided with selling Miguel Almiron to Newcastle. And I think they they felt that these players were replaceable. You you make some money and you you go buy another one. That's the example of that being really difficult to do. So I think if you combine Joseph's injuries with, you know, losing Miguel Almiron and then the, the team, you know, struggling after that. I think the first two or three years was exceptional. And they've, you know, relative to the money they spent and the players they've they brought in, the team, the team has not has not done well. And Joseph's story has kind of go, go, gone along with that. So, but we we know he's an incredible competitor. Um, you know, he was the the profile of the number nine that, that you want in the league, especially those first couple of years. Dynamic, good hold up play, and just an animal in the box, pulling off shoulders, scoring with his feet, scoring with his head. So um, you know, we wish him the best. I don't know where he's going to land, um, but I know it's been pretty volatile in Atlanta. So I wouldn't be surprised if he moved on, whether that's to another MLS club or to Lima, Liga MX, where you can see that being an attractive market for him. Uh, we'll wait and see. Maybe he uh, he ends up at Chivas Guadalajara, maybe. That's just me. Pure speculation there. I have no knowledge whatsoever. I, I know there was another centre forward, a high profile centre forward that uh, was potentially thinking about going to Chivas Guadalajara as well. It's obvious they need a forward. Uh, so maybe, maybe that's one that could happen. As I said, pure and utter speculation from me there. I have no knowledge whatsoever. Um, okay, let's uh, let's talk about that thing that's happening in, in Qatar, shall we, whilst we're talking international football. Uh, Watto, it was the first time, obviously, Canada were involved in the, in the Men's FIFA World Cup since 1986. Uh, how proud were you of their performances? No, it, it, was, it was a big moment. And I think as much as, you know, they, they got to the promised land after a, after a long wait, I think I think the exciting part is just the the way the team plays and 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 the group and some of the players they have. I think it's I think it's a really talented group. Um, you know, and I don't think this is a one off. I have a good feeling they're going to qualify for the next World Cup, primarily because they're hosting and they're already they're already in. But I think they would have qualified anyways. But I think I think the real um, the real positive side is it's it's a talented group, and I think it's it's not just they had a they had a good run in in qualifying. Um, and it's, it's a good group and young, and I think this is sustainable. So I think, I think everyone's really, really excited about that. I, I think it's a little bittersweet in terms of the, the three games they played. I, you know, watching the Belgium game, I think we watched an elite performance. Um, maybe just a little naive, you get, you get caught on a long ball over the top and it's one nil when you've had the majority of the chances and the majority of the play. And to, to go into a game against Belgium, who are, you know, at least in the FIFA rankings, one of the better teams in the world, and to be on the front foot, as we say, and press them and, and try to take the game to them, I thought was really, really impressive. And there was a lot of plaudits after that game. So everyone feels good about that, but don't get the result. Um, Croatia game started incredibly well. Early goal, Alphonse Davies, first goal in a World Cup. And you think we're going to, you know, be off and running and, at that point, it just went downhill. So um, tons of positives, the group, the future. Um, probably just need a little more savvy moving forward to, to manage some of the games. But I think there's a, there's a lot to be really positive about. To, to continue on sort of in the, the positivity of the World Cup. And because, I, I mean, I felt similar to you that Canada looked unbelievable in qualifying, finishing in top of, on top of CONCACAF. I was so excited to see them play. A little disappointed at how it ended because of the quality on that roster, but looking then ahead to, you know, 2026 and what they're going to do. But isn't that why we, I mean, that is what has made this World Cup in particular better than any other World Cup I can remember in quite some time. The quality and the surprises and some of, that's why you play the games. It's that old saying because anybody on any given day can show up and, you know, watching Morocco do what they've been able to do. I mean, ha how much have you just enjoyed watching this World Cup? And I know it's a different time of year. It's November, but how much have you enjoyed it? It's been great. You know, it's kind of stopped the the traditional off season in some ways because there's there's not, uh, the league's all shut down. So there's, there's pretty much only the World Cup going on. So, but enjoyed it. Um, I think it has been really interesting. I think they're, and, and this is a perfect example of this World Cup of just more parity within within the countries. You still have the big countries. They still have, you know, the best chance to, to win the competition. But I think you see talent around the world. I think you see teams that are very fit and very organized. You know, Morocco is probably the best example of that. You know, talented players, but they're fit, they're organized, been really difficult to break down. 
and very dangerous on the counterattack. And that's that's a winning formula. Um, you know, there were there were other teams. Let's look at Saudi Arabia beating Argentina. That was the first game and, and maybe an outlier, but a team like Saudi Arabia, talent organized and you know, uh, a bit of luck with some of your finishing and, and you can beat what could be the the next world champion in Argentina. So I think that side of it's been incredible. And, you know, the the the, the higher ranked country with the bigger stars will, will usually win the game. But I think I think this tournament um, specifically has shown that that's not always the case. And the, the gap's getting a lot closer from top to bottom. I, I wonder, Walter, because there's been a lot said and, and a lot of disagreement with regards to the insinuation that the next World Cup is going to have 48 teams. I, I wonder, is this a counter argument for that? The performances of the likes of Morocco and Canada and Saudi Arabia and so on and so on. Yeah, you know, I haven't I haven't looked at the structure, but I think I think the way this tournament has gone and you look at the, the last games in the group stage, those those were incredible. They're played at the same time. There was so much that could have gone back and forth with a single goal into injury time. So I haven't actually looked at the structure of 48 teams, but I would be really as much as you want more teams in that you think can be competitive. I would I would not want to take away that structure where you get to that final group group stage game and everything's on the line and there's there's so many different things that can happen. Someone scores and two teams are in, two teams are out. Like that that is incredible drama. And I, I would I would want to make sure that we still have that in place moving forward because as much as the knockout games are are incredible to watch and there's so much on the line, that that third third round of the group stage I thought was incredible. Yeah, it was compelling beyond reason, really, wasn't it? It was wonderful to watch. Uh, okay, let's focus then before we let you go, Watto, on the World Cup final itself. It's uh, on Sunday at uh, nine a.m. Central for those of you living under a rock, and um, I, I, it's one of these situations where I, I, I can't pick a winner. Um, I don't think anybody could make any sort of case to convince me for either or because the, the two teams are. Absolutely exceptional. Um, and can I just point out as well, humble brag, I did say prior to the tournaments that I thought Aurelian uh, Chuchameni was going to have a fabulous tournament because of the injuries that France sustained heading into it. No Pogba, no Angolo Conte. I think Chuchameni has made that role his now. Also, Julian Alvarez uh, has proven once again that he's a top draw centre forward as well. Um, I, I get the feeling, Watto, that, that this is a game that's going to come down to individuals. And... and Unsurprisingly, all eyes will be focused on one individual who will be wearing number 10 for Argentina, I'm assuming. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to know if you've actually got a recording of your statements because it's, we can all go <laughs> to this and that, but if there's no proof, then it doesn't really count for much. So if you got some, <laughs> I, would, I would love to hear those, those comments before the tournament started. So, um, no, I, listen, I think, um, I think the final is going to be incredible as much as there's so much drama to get to this point. I think when you have arguably the two best teams in the final with, with big superstars, you know, looking to, to get that, that elusive world cup title, you know, that, that really defines um, a great player from a, a world-class player and a player that is in the discussion of being the best of all time. You know, and I think we're naturally drawn to the narrative of, of Argentina and Messi. Uh, on the other side, you have you have Mbappe with France. Those are those are the two you know the two superstars for each team. Mbappe has a lot more time to to maybe get there. And I think the real compelling story is you know can Argentina you know finally get this for Messi? And as much as this is a this is a team competition and the team wants to win, the country wants to win. Everyone wants them to win for Messi because it's been so elusive. And you know he's he's certainly in the discussion of the the best players of all time. You know his 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 countryman Diego Maradona is is someone that is is usually given that title, and he's always given the nod over Messi because he he won the World Cup. So this this would elevate him to uh, to that level and put him in that discussion. Um, but it's obviously a huge tournament for for both countries. So I think it's going to be compelling. I'm actually as much as you love the underdog, I love the fact it's two two big countries countries that have that have won before and have some of the world's best players. I just think the, the narrative is going to be so compelling for 90-plus for minutes. 
Well, first off, I'd like to say on record that Cal also said it was coming home and that didn't happen. We didn't even talk about England losing. But Wada, you can't you can't get off without at least giving a prediction on the final. We I we gotta know who who thinks gonna win, what's the score line, what do we what do we got here? Yeah. Well, I actually do have some questions for Cal on the coming. <laughs> but I'll answer the question first. So I'm going to go. I think it's going to be an incredible final. I think it's going to be back and forth. I think teams are both teams are going to go at each other. I am going to go Argentina 2-1. And Messi's going to score both goals, one on a penalty and one with a moment of brilliance that will kind of put him in the argument of um, the best of all time with Diego Maradona. You didn't see that the other night when he dribbled everybody down the right hand line, you know, right hand side, maybe one of the future best defenders of the world and nutmeg the player to cross it in. I mean, I don't even care if he gets it an assist if he gets it that way. No, pretty, pretty special. And there's just these two incredible stories, Argentina potentially winning a World Cup. And it's it is so tangible. As much as they want to win just to win and you know, for themselves, the team and the country, everyone wants to win this for Messi. So I think there's there's such a focus on that, but no, he, that, that, that goal where he, he went past um, Guardiola and did his, did his thing and then put it on a plate for Alvarez. That was, that was truly special. And I think um, he's certainly grabbing the moment. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. Do many... Interrupt here. So coming home, give us some thoughts on um, what level of disappointment this was. Um, and I want to know your perspective on, should Harry Kane have taken the second penalty or they sh should they have chose someone else knowing that Lloris plays for the same club, maybe knows the player? Is that is that a better call? Easy with hindsight, but I'd like to know your perspective. Well, well it is easy. Hindsight's twenty twenty, isn't it? But um, first and foremost, I had Brazil winning the whole thing. So uh, I don't know where that suggestion of it's coming home came from. Um, <laughs> of course, I would have loved it to have happened, but... Um, as soon as England drew France in the quarterfinals, I thought to myself that that's probably it now. I, I just couldn't see us beating France. Um, Jude Bellingham, I thought, was exceptional. He's 19. He's 19. And I thought he he looked like one of the best central midfielders in the world. Uh, and I can't wait to see what he looks like in, in a couple of more years' time. Um, in terms of the penalty, Watto, yeah, I, I can see exactly what you're saying. Um, but I also see the counter-argument where... He's the captain um, and he wants, I'm assuming, he, he wanted to take on that responsibility and take the pressure off of anybody else. Um, but, you know, because if he scores, then then no one says anything. But it, yeah. it it's such a difficult one because also we, we don't know, maybe, maybe nobody else wanted to take the penalty. We just don't know, do we? Uh, and so it's so hard to sort of predict these kind of things and talk about these kind of things. But ultimately he missed it, it, it and... and <laughs> He, that's going to be a moment that haunts him for a long, long time, I'm sure. But um, I thought it was a good tournament for England. It was about where I thought that England were going to get when you looked at how the groups could possibly uh, line up into the knockout rounds. Um, but I think now, very similar to the US, actually, we, we as in England, we have a very young core group. And the next tournament, the European Championships in two years' time, Everybody is going to be two years older. Everybody is going to have had that wonderful World Cup experience. Everybody, I think, is going to be able to manage situations better. Uh, and hopefully everybody plays at the highest level they possibly can for the next couple of years heading into the Euros. So, uh, again, I would fancy England to be one of the favourites for the European Championship. So I think we're we're about as in a good of position as we, we have been for a long time. And, Kay, I think we could probably say that about the United States as well, couldn't we? No, with, with the performances of of Tyler Adams, who, who I thought was legitimately world-class at times. I thought Tim Ream was wonderful. I thought Matt Turner made the saves he had to make. Um, the one thing that was glaringly obvious to me, which which we have said on this podcast for many a month now, um, I, I just wasn't convinced the US had enough goals in them because of the, the real lack of a centre-forward. Um, but with all of that in, in mind, they now have that, that experience moving into the Gold Cup, and maybe even the Copa America from the reports that are being suggested as well. So surely, Kay, the U.S. are in a wonderful situation moving forward. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I, I, it, it bothered me before the U.S. started this tournament that we were already focusing on 2026. I didn't want to surpass 2022 before the the focus came on, oh, well, they'll all have more experience. Or we've already qualified, as, as Wado said, with Canada, you're hosting, so the United States will have it. 
but I really felt like um, they showed well in this tournament. And I do think that it's promising then for the future for 2026, what that looks like with this core group, if they stay healthy and they stay um, in the mix. And yes, there's clearly some things that still need to be sorted out. The number nine didn't resolve itself. Um, you know, it didn't show any better in this tournament, which is unfortunate. And, um, you know, speaking of Vasquez, I mean, the, the debate will rage on there as well. And if there, some other players should have been brought in and had an opportunity. But at the end of the day, I think 2026 is going to be just as phenomenal as 2022, not just with the United States, not just with England, with Canada's core group now, but just all the, the teams that are going to be there. I, I agree 100 percent. I was impressed. It was enjoyable. It was exciting to watch the United States and to to go to the watch parties and cheer them on and, and see the kind of the fervor and the fever around it. And imagine what that's going to be like in 2026 when it's here in North America. It, it's going to be incredible. And before we let you go, Watto, um, I'm assuming it's a similar feeling for Canada as well. And, and now moving into the Gold Cup, and, and as we said, maybe the Copa America, depending on how conversations go, allegedly. What do we think the expectation is for Canada now over the, the course of the next couple of years? I think I think they're similar to the U.S. Um, I think I mean I think both teams have a really really bright future. I mean, you look at some of the young players. You, you look at some of the clubs they're playing at. This this has never happened before. I mean, you look at you look at the the players on the U.S. roster right now. You've got you've got Chelsea. You've got Juventus. You've got Leeds. You've got Borussia Dortmund. You've got players playing at an elite level. You know, and I agree with you on Tyler Adams. I think he'll be playing for a top five club in the world in the next couple of years. I mean, you're talking tenacity, athleticism, his feet are good. He's got leadership qualities. I mean, the, the, the future is really bright. Um, so I think the challenge for both, both of the clubs is to continue um, developing their players, having their players play regularly for their club teams and at the highest level possible. And then to, you know, to create as, as strong a development plan as you can you know knowing that you won't have to go through qualifying i think that's a tricky tricky thing so to get in as many competitive environments as you can so gold cups copa americas any sort of tournament where there's something on the line continue to test yourselves against you know the best countries in the world um and and do what you can like i said without having a qualifying schedule to kind of battle test you to give yourself as much experience at, at as high a level as possible going into the 2026 world cup also, uh, a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, good luck in the scouting endeavours and what have you as you prepare for the Minnesota United season moving forward. Really appreciate the time. Thanks, guys. Always enjoy it. Take care. When injury takes you out of the game, it's time for your team to step up. At Alana Health Orthopaedics, you'll get expert care backed by a whole health system of providers. With convenient locations, virtual options, and an app that gives you 24-7 access to your records, test results, and care team, you're always close to the care that you need. Schedule now at alanahealth.org.